Okay, this video is called Art from the Passion of Christ. And, you know, tomorrow is Easter, so I'm making all these videos together. Plus, I enjoyed really going through all this art. And I've noticed I don't get many views for this stuff on, on YouTube. And I wonder if it's because people aren't interested or I wonder if it's, you know, shadow, you know what, bond. Um, I bet you that's the real reason. But be that as it may, this is beautiful stuff. I'm going to show it. So here is the taking of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. I always have a hard time saying that. And uh, the one who betrayed him gives him with a kiss, betrayed with a kiss, and then the soldiers take Christ. And he goes before the high priest of the Pharisees, Caiaphas, and he asks them, who are you? What have you done? And the thing that they use to get him on is for blasphemy because he says, you know, yes, I am, you know, sort of the son of man, the son of God. Um, and they don't want to do it him themselves, but they want uh, Pilate. So they take him to the Roman uh, leader there, which is Pilate. And Pilate begins to question Christ. And Pilate cannot find him to have done anything wrong. He hasn't done anything wrong in Pilate's attitude. But Pilate's a little bit wimpy. Uh, he doesn't want to piss off the locals. So Pilate sort of takes him before the crowd. And this is called Ecce Homo, Behold the Man. And so he has the audience take a look at him. And this is a beautiful painting by Antonio Cicere. And he basically, it's from 1871, he basically says, and by the way, most of the great paintings that you know, they come from the 1800s. That was an incredible time of painting. The sort of uh, romantic realism, you could call the style, and it's magnificent. Okay, so anyways, the crowd is now given a choice. Who will you choose to crucify? Oh, again, here's a look at him from the front. Christ, there's Pontius Pilate. Here's the crowd. Will you crucify him or Barabbas? So behold the man. Mihawe Munkachi is a, the, the painter for that painting. Here's another painting of the same thing. Christ brought before the crowd, Pontius Pilate. And they're given a choice. Will they want to crucify Christ or they want to crucify Barabbas, who's a known sort of criminal who causes all kinds of trouble. But the crowd chooses to crucify Christ. They've kind of been stirred up to do it. Pharisees had planted people in the crowd, stir up public opinion against Christ. And the decision then is made from the crowd, says we want Christ crucified. And Pontius Pilate knows he's innocent. But he kind of wimps out. Pontius Pilate washes his hands of the matter. And someday you will be asked, who will you crucify? Barabbas or Christ? <laughs> and most people will crucify Christ, okay, because they're wimps. And they'll do whatever they think is expedient at the moment. But what they don't understand is in the long run, you crucify Christ and then you're all screwed. All right, so here is the disrobing of Christ. The Roman soldiers take off Christ's clothes. They disrobe him, humiliate him. Oops, I kind of jumped when I get back to here. And um, then, I want to get to the way. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm getting out of where he's presenting. Okay, here it is. So now they then take him, and this is the flagellation of Christ. He's, he's uh, whipped. And um, they put a crown of thorns on him. And Jordan Peterson, like I said, I disagree with a lot of things that guy says, but he was right. He said Christ was the best person, and he had the worst thing happen to him. He's completely innocent, and he suffered terribly. And here he is walking down the Via Dolorosa. So Via Dolorosa is the painful path, the way of the cross. There's a good song by that same name, Via Dolorosa. There's also a good song called, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? This painting is by Harry Antis, and it's a beautiful painting. Here's Christ coming around the corner with the cross there. Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Great song. Sam Cooke sings a great version of that. Um, Johnny Cash sings a good version of it, but Sam Cooke is better for that song. And here Christ stumbles, and when he stumbles, a lady named Veronica, you know, he's all sweaty and he's bleeding over his forehead. She offers him her veil to wipe his face, you know, from the sweat and the blood. And he does, and his face appears on the veil. So this is the veil of Veronica. And it's from the living Christ when he stumbled at the cross. And that's in comparison, because you hear about the Shroud of Turin when his facial expression was copied onto another handkerchief. But that was after he was dead. So that's the difference between the veil of Veronica and the Shroud of Turin. Okay, here's another painting by a contemporary artist named John McNaughton, and this guy's a great artist, and he puts a lot of, in a sense, social commentary into the picture. You can see in this painting there's Lenin, I'm sorry, there's, there's Stalin, and Stalin, you know, killed millions and millions and millions of Christians. 
Okay, there's Marx, whose you know craziness has led to the death of over 100 million Christians. Here is Lenin, who sort of led the uh, you know the Russian Revolution back in uh, you know 1918, 1917. Uh, looks like they got Joan of Arc in the picture. They got uh, you know uh, Mother Teresa. A lot of famous people are in this picture. There's Napoleon. There's Henry VIII. There's you know who from you know where. That looks like Columbus. And there's a whole bunch of other ones in this picture. I'd have to look for a while to find them all, but they're pretty famous. And there's the commentary. There's probably the good pope, the Polish pope, John Paul II. Uh, so anyways, Christ is stumbling. And it was Simon the Cyrenian that helped him carry the cross. I'm not sure who this guy is supposed to be. Maybe it's you and me. Okay, here's Christ carrying the cross when he falls. This is a painting by Raphael. And, you know, Virgin Mary reaches out. She's got the blue on, Queen of Heaven. The red is one of the Marys, you know, Mary Magdalene. The other two Marys, I've heard different things about who they are. You know, one thing says they're sisters of the Virgin Mary. Another one said something that seemed a little different. Okay, here's the Virgin Mary reaches out to Christ when he stumbles underneath the cross as he's walking down Via Della Rosa. And again, Via Della Rosa is a pretty nice song. And he stumbles again and he needs help. And the Roman soldiers call this man over here Simon from Serenia. So he's Simon the Serenian to help carry the cross. So Simon the Serenian carries the cross for a while, gives Christ a little bit of a break for a moment there. You can see there's Mary with the blue and the red. Okay, there's the other Marys. That's the Virgin Mary. Okay, so now they reach uh, Calvary. Calvary is like the name of the hill, and it means Calvarium Skull. The Skull Hill, also called Golgotha. And this is a giant painting. It's like 100 feet long, done by this Polish artist, Jan Steika. And this has sort of been called the Polish Sistine Chapel. If you see it all in more detail, magnified, it's a rather magnificent, beautiful painting. Okay, here it is in an auditorium, just to give you a sense of the scope of how big this, this painting is. It's huge, like 100 feet long. Like I said, that's why it's called the Polish Sistine Chapel. It's incredible. Okay, here's the raising of the cross. This is by Peter Paul Rubens as they're elevating the cross up. He's been crucified, nailed to the cross, his hands and his feet. They're getting ready to send the thieves up next to him. Okay, so here's the raising of the cross. This one by James Tissett. So here's Christ on the cross now. You know, Mary's fainted. The other Mary is, you know, quite sad, and then John is with them. And here's one artist, Harry Antis. His interpretation of it is that the right hand has the fingers curled in the shape of a blessing, that his hands make a V for a victory sign. It's been also called the mousetrap that captured the devil. Um, here is Jacobo Tintoretto's painting of the crucifixion. Rather extraordinary. They're starting to raise one of the thieves. You know, there's a good thief and the bad thief, one on each side of them. This is Adoration of the Trinity by Albrecht Dürer. He was a German artist from the Renaissance who was also great at making wood carvings. And it's the Trinity because, again, God the Father right behind him and the Holy Spirit above and the symbol of the dove. Okay, and usually you'll have, like, the regular people on the ground. Then you'll have the saints and whatnot and the heavenly people right here. And you'll have more, perhaps, angels above. Okay, crucifixion by Tissot. So the good thief, you know, recognized that Jesus was God, and he said, "Oh, please forgive me for my sins, and please remember me when remember me." And then God said with me, said to him, "Tonight you will be in paradise." And the bad thief cursed God on the cross, and God, you know, wasn't too amused with his behavior. Okay, here's an interesting painting by Andrea Mantegna in 1450. And this is Longinus, the Roman centurion soldier. He had a long spear, and he actually went on to pierce Christ in the side. And from that wound, Christ bled. And that wound, the blood from that wound, went into the Holy Grail. That's thought to have, you know, almost magical powers for healing. The Roman soldiers played dice to gamble for his remaining clothes. The skull of Adam is at the foot of the cross, Golgotha, Skull Mountain. And these are all the Marys, you know. Mary the Virgin, Mary Magdalene, and then her sisters. 
Here's a painting of the crucifixion, this one by Mihawe Munkasi, and now you can see there's uh, the thief on each side of him, the good thief over there, and then the bad thief over here. And here's the lance piercing his side to Longinus the centurion before he realized what he was doing. And he saw water come out as well as blood. And now here's the Holy Grail being raised up to the wound of Christ to capture the blood, to have the healing powers of it. And then later on, the Knights of King Arthur sought that Holy Grail for its magical healing powers. This is just showing that same crucifixion painting in the context of the church altar. And you can see how amazing it is. And this is a characteristic thing of Catholic churches. Obviously, this is better than the average one, but all these paintings tell a story in context. It's a way you could teach illiterate people about the, you know, what's in the Bible, but they're just magnificent. They're aesthetically beautiful. And there is such a thing as, I would say, aesthetic Christianity. And I did mention Robert Barron, the Bishop Barron's um, ideas that basically see people see all these paintings and they see how beautiful they are and that attracts them to the paintings. And then as they contemplate them more, they realize how good they are. You know, the ideas embodied in them. And that subsequently, you know, with more contemplation, they realize... You know, there's a truth in all these. There's a message in all these that is good, and it's empowering. It's uplifting. The reason why, you know, the billionaire perverts don't want um, the proles to learn about religion and Christianity is because it empowers them. Also, what does religion mean? It means relegare, legare, to ligate, to tie together. It ties the people together. It unifies them. It tells them they're all equal in the eyes of God, and that makes them more powerful, and that's why... You know, if you want to tyrannize people, you don't want them powerful. You want them weak. You want them feminized, okay? You want them stupid. You want them docile. Okay, so here is, you know, Christ talking with the good thief who says, Please remember, Christ, I realize you are the God. And he is saved. Here's just another painting of it. This one is by Vasily Golinsky in 1895. So back before the Russian Revolution in 1917, there actually were a lot of good Russian artists and good Russian writers. So intrinsically, the Russian people have talent. They just, you know, once once you get rid of Christianity, everything goes to shit. The place turns into poverty. You need Christianity to have good ethics and have people be nice to each other. You need capitalism to have a profitable economy, okay? And you need the Constitution to protect free speech and other rights of individuals. You have those three things, you end up with the relative utopia for mankind. Okay, so this is just showing, you know, Christ about ready to give up the ghost here. And here's after Christ died, you know, Father, I commend my spirit unto you. Earlier before that, he had a tense moment where he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? And now, though, he's taken down from the cross, is a descent from the cross. This one's by Rosier van der Veden. This is one of the greatest paintings of all time. I mean, it's magnificent. It was funded by, guess what, Guild? The Archer's Guild. See how Christ's body mimics that of a, a bow and arrow as if they're drawing his legs back? I'm not sure which one is Nicodemus and which one is Joseph of Arimathea. Okay, you know that this is Mary Magdalene, you know, mourning for the death of Christ. She's at the foot of the cross. And um, this is the mother, Virgin Mary. She's in blue, like the Queen of Heaven. And her body position echoes that of Christ. She feels the suffering and pain. This is John, one of the disciples who later was assigned to basically take care of her. After he, you know, before he died, he said, you know, John, you take care of each other to his mother and to the Virgin Mary. Uh, these are the other uh, two Marys, okay, so those are the four Marys at the cross. The Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, and the other two Marys, you know, and how you want to describe them as Sisters of Mary, or exactly how you can describe them. It's a little bit confusing, we're not going to go into it, but that's the story. This guy's probably just a worker there. But it's a magnificent painting. This was done in 1435. Look how spectacular the ability to convey emotion in this painting. It's so sad, you want to cry yourself. I mean, it's magnificent. Okay, here's the Pieta made by Michelangelo. And, you know, his mother died when he was young, only about six or seven years old. And, you know, he, he pined for her. He missed her. He's sad. And in a sense, this is like Michelangelo in the lap of his mother. She's kind of big compared to him, okay? And it's like the young boy looking up to his mother, and it's incredibly sad. This is the most beautiful, magnificent sculpture ever made. And Pieta, you know, the sadness of it, the pity, the mercy, it's, it's just magnificent. It's like it's beyond great. It's the greatest ever. It's so incredible by Michelangelo, young Michelangelo. And here's another um, sculpture. This one is by uh, Niccolo 
de la Arca. And what's unique about this one is, like I said, this idea of the Renaissance being primarily Greek and Roman art, rebirth of the classics, is not entirely true. Because, and you know, I learned this a lot too from this guy named Valdemar Janczusek. He is an art critic who does a lot of work on the YouTube channel called Perspective. And he's really good. When I first saw him, you know, he's kind of fat, dopey guy at first. And I thought, is this guy any good? I'll just give him a chance. I'll watch it. But once I watched him, I'm like, wow, he's the best of the contemporary critics. Don't get me wrong. I think most university critics suck because they're tied into the wimpiness of their contemporary age. You know, for example, like I joke about a university psychologist. They can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. So how are they going to help you with a relationship? But anyways... Be that as it may, Waldemar Jankusik is a pretty good art critic. I, I like him. I learned a lot from him. He knows a lot, and he's got a lot of energy. He travels all over the world to study art in its context. And um, so anyways, this is a pretty intensely religious uh, sculpture here. You know, the weeping and wailing. You know, that's probably Mary Magdalene. There's one of the other Marys. There's the Virgin Mary. And look how sad they are. There's John. That's got to be Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. At the death of Christ as he's been taken down from the cross. And it's intensely sad. It's intensely religious. And that's characteristic of Renaissance painting to be super, super religious. Okay? So this Renaissance secular humanism stuff has been quite exaggerated in the Renaissance context. It's mostly intensely religious. So here's a burial of Christ by Carl Bloch. He painted the paintings from the life of Christ. And this one's done in 1850. And that's another thing, like I said, you'll see... More great paintings. Uh, I can't uh, get myself out of there. You'll see more great paintings from the 1800s than any other time. Um, there's just tons of them. And I'm only showing you the best of the best. There's lots of other really good ones. Okay, so they're getting ready to put Christ into his tomb. Everyone is very sad. The disciples are wondering, is it all over? Is that it? Is that the end of the ministry? It's all done. Okay, here's another one. This one's by Caravaggio. And Caravaggio, Caravaggio is spectacular in his portrayal of detail and realism. But he's not as good as some of the artists in portrayal of emotion. That's why I like Roger van der Veen better than him, even though Caravaggio is a more precise, realistic painter. Um, Roger van der Veen and Botticelli even, they're better able to evoke emotion. But Caravaggio is still a magnificent genius. He's the greatest painter of the 1600s. Okay, so that's it for the Passion of Christ. But now we're going to do some like Resurrection of Christ stuff. There's a story that's been called the harrowing of hell. Other people say he didn't go to hell. He just went into limbo, kind of like purgatory. And he helped free the souls from there or speed up their ability to get to heaven. Um, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not hell even exists. And some people say a true loving God would never even have a hell. And then other people say it wasn't really in the Bible. It's never really in the Bible that it was just written into the Bible. There's other people who say, well, you need to have a hell to get people to be good. Um, there's other people who say, well, anybody who completely rejects God deserves to be in hell. What is hell? Hell is life without God, life without Christ. So I'm not going to get into all of those, but I do think there's more merit than one thinks for that idea of hell doesn't really exist. But I don't quite know how it all works. Like I said, I can't you know, understand simple things on this planet. How am I going to understand a complex thing beyond it? Uh, but be that as it may, here's just one of the paintings of the resurrection by Andrea Mantegna, Christ stepping out of the tomb. Here's a painting of the resurrection by Mikhail Nestorov. I think he's another one of these Russian artists. And like I said, the Russian artists, they made a lot of really good paintings and good books before the commies took over and destroyed everything and ruined artistic creativity and, and declared them to be talking monkeys rather than humans with a soul. Okay, here's a painting of the Resurrection of Christ. This one's by John McNaughton, and he's the contemporary artist. This guy's great. He's the best of the contemporary artists uh, for religious themes. He's magnificent. So it's a rather spectacular painting, and those are the two angels. The stone has been railed away. He's, he's exited the tomb. Here's a painting of the Resurrection by Noel Koipa from 1700. Again, very nice painting. Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Christ after he was resurrected, and at first she thought he was the gardener. She didn't realize it was Christ. Christ then sort of came along with some of the disciples. They're walking to Emau, and um, Christ started talking with them and didn't immediately reveal who he was, and then they gradually realized it as they saw how much he, he knew. It's a nice painting of walk on the road to Emau. And here he is, you know, supper at Emau. This is by Karl Bloch. 
and the disciples are starting you can see his sort of stunned you know body position they're starting to realize this is Christ he's got the halo around him okay and then there's another painting of Supper of Yuma, and this one is by Caravaggio and this is a stunning moment where he's almost ready to jump out of his chair and he's startled to realize oh yes this is Christ okay and he cheers them up he gives them reason to be hopeful and you know kind of one of the central points of Christianity is that you can phrase it by Dostoevsky God and the devil are fighting for the heart of men Sometimes, even if he has to do it alone and his conduct seems crazy, a man must set an example and so draw men's souls out of their solitude and spur them to some act of brotherly love that the great idea may not die. Fyodor Dostoevsky was awesome, okay? He's one of my favorite writers. The best novel ever written was uh, Kirsten's Carol by Charles Dickens. Second best novel, they're all Christian. Second best novel ever written was uh, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Third best novel ever written was Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian. Victor Hugo is a French guy. Charles Dickens, of course, is an English guy. And then the fourth best novel ever written is um, uh, Quo Vadis by uh, Henry Sienkiewicz. It's a masterpiece, man. It's about early Christianity. It's just brilliant. Um, and then I would probably put um, Da Vinci Code. Even though Da Vinci Code has got a lot of stuff in there that's not true, Dan Brown did just a magnificent job of writing it. But you notice that the best novels ever, they come from Christianity. It just creates the themes that resonate with the human heart, the human life. And the morals of Christianity, another reason why tyrants don't like them is because they tell everybody, do the right thing no matter what. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. Right is right, even if no one's doing it. What God says is above what, what any man says. So earthly rulers don't like that. They don't want people to see an allegiance to the God up above or to be united by the God up above. They want them to be obedient, talking, docile monkeys that do as they're told. Okay, here's a painting of Christ giving the keys of heaven to St. Peter as the first pope of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church was around hundreds of years before the Bible. Here's the, the disciple Thomas, the doubting Thomas. He didn't believe it until he saw the actual wound of Christ on the side, put his finger in and saw the stigmata on his hands and the feet of Christ. And then he believed. And um, Christ said, and even more precious are those who have not seen and yet believed. The transfiguration of Christ, where he had his conversation with his uh, old saints there. Here is a painting of... Um, the Book of Revelation by El Greco, 1650, opening of the fifth seal of the seven seals of uh, Revelations. Okay. Here is a painting about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, and that's hopefully not coming soon. I certainly hope not. Everything that goes with that. <laughs> one is uh, on the white horse for conquest, pestilence, plague, war. Another one on, for red for war. Another one black for famine. And then the pale rider on a pale horse for death. Kind of scary. Now here it is from Revelations. It says, When the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. I looked and behold, a white horse, he who sat upon it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out to conquer. Another on a horse fiery red went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and there was given to him a great sword. Then a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. It sounds like justice or something. Then there was a pale horse with a pale rider, and that's death from the Bible, Book of Revelations. Okay, then here's some artist interpretations of the pearly gates of heaven. One art, artist has that. Okay, here's another artist's idea of a second coming of Christ coming down in a sort of a sunny halo-like cloud and him getting closer there. Here's another artist's idea. This one's McNaughton again, the famous contemporary artist of Christ coming down on a white horse. And in this context, red is the color of love. Okay, um, and here's another idea of the second coming of Christ, chasing out the Satanists, the people who are doing all the evil in the world. And here is uh, the idea of let God make the rules, okay, as a third party to appeal to. Your secular ruler is always, you know, going to want to loot things for themselves and take the most for themselves, whereas God says be fair and reasonable with everybody. Uh, here's another John McNaughton, this contemporary artist, how great he is. Look at this. He's sort of pointing, you know, the savior of mankind. Look, you're going to keep your amendments. You're going to keep your free speech. You're going to keep your rights to privacy and to the other things that are necessary for you to have a good life. Okay, and he puts, you know, 
all these people around him, and everybody can be unified around Christ. Everybody's welcome. All you have to do is say, I acknowledge Christ to be my Savior. That's all you got to do is say, you're a Christian. Just say that, okay? And um, anybody, and you don't need to be a Christian. You just need to have Christian ethics, which basically means be nice to each other, okay? <laughs> Obey the Ten Commandments, be nice to each other. And so here's some artist uh, symbolism of Christ defeating Satan. But in real life, you know, you want Christ to show up and help out. Satan's pretty powerful on earth. Um, and right now he seems to be dominating and pushing everybody to slavery. And then here's another famous painting by one of the uh, William Holman Hunt, who was in the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood of Artists that sort of went back to the style from before Raphael that I talked about in one of my earlier videos today on art with uh, you know Ruskin's speech, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, meaning the technique before Raphael, the artist, meaning more devoted to a true sense of theologic appreciation. And uh, Lai Proust, lots of great artists. So the, the point of the painting is Christ knocks, will you enter? There's no, there's no door. Christ doesn't open the door. You have to open the door from inside and accept him into your life. And if everybody would accept the basic principles of be nice to everybody like Christ recommended, we'd all be better off. And that's the end of my videos today. So happy Easter. I hope that was interesting and useful to you.